so hydrogen, and then carbon nucleophiles. Uh, some of the carbon nucleophiles start to become a little bit weaker, like the Gilman and the acetylide are weaker nucleophiles, which helps us transition into the weak nucleophile chapter of chapter 18, where we look at oxygen, nitrogen, cyanide, and our enolates. Okay? So, our spider diagram shows all of the reactivity coming out from our central carbonyl structure. So our central carbonyl is what's providing us. We can get our little drawing in there. That's providing us the, this light is bothering me. There we go. Um, providing us our addition center. So that's our pi bond that reacts. Okay. All of those reagents on the outside are the nucleophile that then goes through and reacts with it. Okay. You're responsible for knowing each of those reagents and some of the conditions that go through with them. Okay. We'll call out attention to most of them in significant detail. Some of them we won't spend as much time on. For instance, acetylide we barely talk about. Okay. So we'll start with the exciting one, a hydrogen nucleophile. Okay. How can I possibly get a hydrogen nucleophile? Okay. Why might we consider a hydrogen nucleophile impossible to get? It doesn't like being negatively charged. Okay. Have we seen hydrides exist? Do we have H- as a reagent? Yeah, yeah where? H4. Okay. So there were two examples that we could pull up. You guys conveniently just shouted out two of them, or both of them. We could look at sodium borohydride, and we could look at sodium hydride. Okay, our sodiums are spectator ions. For the most part, we'll completely ignore those, though we'll come back and address those in a second. Both of these are now negatively charged. Sodium hydride is so unstable that the hydride stays attached to the sodium, okay, which means sodium hydride acts exclusively as... A base. Which means it can't act as a nucleophile. So sodium hydride is not a nucleophile, not useful for us. Okay? It is so reactive that it doesn't break away from the sodium until it has a place to immediately react, which ultimately means on the surface of the su substrate, which means acid-base reactions. How could we possibly stabilize that negative hydrogen in another fashion? Well, that's where our borohydride comes into play. If we look at our Lewis structure for sodium borohydride, in particular, just the borohydride, officially our minus charge is on the boron. Okay? But if we look at the Lewis structure for boron, it is very happy with only three bonds. Okay? So it now has that fourth bond, not really exceeding its octet, but putting it at a higher charge state. So what does the boron decide to do? get rid of those electrons. Okay? Hydrogen will take those electrons away to become hydride. This means hydrogen is stealing electrons from boron. Why are you saying how? Did you say how? Yeah. Okay. Hydrogen <laughs> is the least electronegative element we've looked at. How could it possibly steal electrons from boron? Has anybody looked up the electronegativity for boron? Similar. It's actually lower than that for hydrogen. Oh, okay. That's why hydrogen can steal the electrons from boron. Hydrogen comes in at a 2.3 and boron's about a 2.1, I believe. And you can check those. I'm not positive on those numbers, but I think I'm right. Okay. So that means hydrogen can indeed steal the electrons from our boron, which is what we're looking at. When we look at our active structure, we're really evaluating H- as our active reagent. The boron is acting only as a stabilizing agent, like sodium. Right? It's acting to stabilize those electrons. Boron can do a better job than our sodium because boron is using 2p electrons, or the empty 2p orbital. It's going to hold those electrons a little bit better 
then jumping up to sodium's 3s. Okay. So when we're looking at hydride nucleophiles, we have to have something stabilizing them like boron. Are there other atoms like boron? Like what? Nitrogen is happy with only three bonds, but if I drew out the Lewis structure for nitrogen to make it happy, it would have the extra pair of electrons. Is that going to allow me to get an H minus? No. What I need is something. This atom X has to have an empty orbital for the hydrogen to dump electrons into. What other elements might be out there like boron? Aluminum. You mean the element immediately underneath it in its family that we learned in Gen Chem? All elements in the same column have the same reactivity? Yeah. Okay. So I can look at borohydrides and I can look at aluminum hydrides. They're both doing the exact same thing because they have the same type of electron configuration where they have that empty orbital that hydride can potentially dump electrons into. Okay? So it is that species that helps for this reaction to occur. Okay? So our two big reagents, sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride. Okay? Anybody notice anything different about those two reactions? Okay? I see water in the top case versus an acid in the bottom. What else? You want a hint? Uh, sure, we can reference the ether reflux versus nothing, which means what's happening in the top one? Room temperature, okay. also known as RT typically. Anybody else notice a difference? Okay. We have sodium versus lithium. What else? Aluminum versus boron. What else? Two steps versus one step. All of these things are important pieces of information. Okay? Any guesses as to what those differences ultimately mean about the reactivity of sodium borohydride versus lithium aluminum hydride? They are reductants, so that's a good point. We can classify these as reducing agents because we are adding hydride, we're adding H minus across our pi bond. They are both reducing agents, which is the same thing as a reductant. Is the lithium aluminum hydride stronger? Why might you say the lithium aluminum hydride is stronger? Because it needs two steps. Why would we need two steps? Well, if you add a bunch of ketones, then it probably oxidize all of them or reduce all of them. Well, they're always going to reduce your ketones. Second step here, what do we add? Or think about the overall reaction. What have we added to the pi bond? Beginning to end. Look at the carbonyl compound and look at the... Two hydrogens. Two hydrogens is one way to say it, and I would argue that's not quite fully correct. We added hydride and hydrogen. We added hydride where? The carbonyl carbon, because the carbonyl carbon is what charge? Positive, and our hydride, being negative, is likely to associate with that. We're also adding hydrogen ion, which is, by default, positive, and that's going to be connected to our negative oxygen. So when we talk about these patterns of finding positives and negatives, here they are. Okay, so if we can acknowledge their existence, we can help kind of shift and see those. Right. What is different between lithium aluminum hydride's addition of hydride and hydrogen in comparison to sodium borohydride's addition of hydrogen and hydride? 
Sodium borohydride, it does it all at once. We're adding a negative hydrogen at the same time we're adding a positive hydrogen, at least in the reaction. Okay. What would that suggest about the reactivity of the hydride in sodium borohydride? Get two answers. Stronger or weaker, right? What do you think? Stronger. If it is more reactive, what is that hydride likely to react with? The hydrogen. Is sodium borohydride stronger or weaker? weaker? It is weaker. Because I have in the mixture with sodium borohydride, I have both the hydride source and the hydrogen source in the exact same solution. Whereas in the lithium aluminum hydride situation, what happened? I had the hydride source first, followed by the hydrogen source as a secondary step. Why? If I put them both together, what does lithium aluminum hydride do? The lithium aluminum hydride will actually donate hydrides to hydrogen to form H2 gas. And we would just get hydrogen gas bubbling out of the solution. The lithium aluminum hydride would ask almost exclusively as a base instead of as a nucleophile. Okay. When lithium aluminum hydride is reactive, what does it react as? What makes it active? H what? H minus. It's a very strong reducing agent. It's a super strong reducing agent. Why? Because it's attached to the aluminum. The lithium doesn't matter. It does, actually, believe it or not. Okay? You're moving to the next step of the sequence. All we were trying to look at first is why are these different? And there's multiple ways we can see why they are different. The way that most people went through and saw this, which unfortunately wasn't you, was they saw that there were two steps here. We did hydride, then hydrogen. Sodium borohydride, we did it all at once. All at once would suggest that sodium borohydride is a weaker hydride or a weaker reducing agent. That is, that is true. Why is it different as far as its reactivity? Well, I think the answer you're looking for is because it's not happening in two steps. No. Well, all we're trying to do is look for patterns between these two reagents first. Okay? And so what you've done is you've seen the answer and now saying, now that I know the answer, I'm going to go back and try and find a pattern within it. Okay? How many of you knew the answer before we looked for the pattern? That's the challenge. Most people aren't seeing the answer first. Okay? All they've seen is that these two have different reagents, so we're looking for those patterns, trying to come up with a way to explain the difference in their reactivity. Why would we use one instead of the other? Sodium borohydride is not as active a reducing agent. Is that true based on the answer? Yes. It's not as strong a reducing agent as this. How did we come to that conclusion based off of the information given in our reactions? This is shown as two steps. This one's shown as one step. Okay. Making the statement, well, that lithium aluminum hydride is a stronger reducing agent. Well, why? What about lithium aluminum hydride makes you say that that's the stronger reducing agent? All we're trying to do is, again, establish the patterns of looking at our reactions. That's it. Okay. So we were just looking for differences between these, period. Is it okay. Once we've established there's a difference, now we can start to narrow in on why might there be a difference. Okay. But before we even get there, I want to address some of these other issues. Notice, we're adding our hydrogen as a second step here, and not mechanistic, reaction step. This is one, two. Whereas for sodium borohydride, it is a single step. Right. That means our lithium aluminum hydride is clearly more reactive than sodium borohydride because I can't add the hydrogen at the same time. Not only that, I have to add the hydride when? First. Okay. Because if I add it second, it ends up reacting with the hydrogen. Okay. Other things to watch out for. When we take a look at water, 
What kind of solvent is water? Polar protic. The hydrogen that we're adding is coming from water. It's a protic solvent. Take a look at the solvent for lithium aluminum hydride. What is our solvent? Ether. What does our ether functional group look like? An oxygen between two carbons. Describe it. Non-reactive is fair, yes, but water you told me polar and protic. Ether is aprotic. It is also polar, not as polar, but it is polar aprotic. One of the big considerations in our solvent for lithium aluminum hydride is that it is so reactive with hydrogen that our solvent must be aprotic. Because if it is aprotic, what happens? The hydride reacts with the acidic hydrogen. Okay. This is an important thing to identify because our structure could have other functional groups on it. For instance, it could have an alcohol somewhere in that structure. If I want to run the reduction and my structure starts with an alcohol, can I use lithium aluminum hydride? No, because it'll run the acid-base reaction instead of doing the reduction. Okay, so I have to think about the nuances and the differences of their chemistry. Okay. What's the difference between polar aprotic and polar What does protic mean? Polar what does protic mean? Not just H's. It has H plus. It has acidic hydrogens. How do we get an acidic hydrogen? Not just an electronegative atom. It has to be connected to oxygen, oxygen nitrogen, nitrogen, or fluorine. It has to be a hydrogen bonding solvent. An aprotic solvent means you can have hydrogens, but... Not attached to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. Okay. When do you have acidic hydrogens? In step two. I've already done the reaction with the hydride. It's done. Only after that reaction has happened do I introduce the acidic hydrogens. This is why there's two steps. Step one, then step two. Not two reagents, two steps. So in the first step, the lithium aluminum hydride is reacting with the ether. What is the lithium aluminum hydride reacting with in the first reaction? Well, reacting with the carbonyl. What is the ether doing? I don't know. It begins with an S. It's our solvent. It's what dissolves everything. Okay, that's it. It's only acting as a solvent. Why does the solvent matter? Okay, the solvent allows two things to interact with each other. Okay, if you were trapped in a box and your potential partner was trapped in another box, would you ever be able to interact? No. What would you need? Something to mediate you interacting with your partner. That mediator is... The solvent. That's the whole reason we have solvents, is to help two things interact with each other. That's why they're there. So then okay. how does the ether make the hydride stronger? I didn't say the ether made the hydride song stronger. The hydride was stronger, which meant we could not use a protic solvent. We had to use an aprotic solvent. That's why we have to use ether, because the hydride is already stronger. Why do we know the hydride was stronger? There's two ways, as Cass has pointed out. First way, there's two distinct steps. Okay? Second way, we know the answer, and the answer is lithium aluminum hydride is a stronger reducing agent. Okay? That's where we're going next. Okay? Kind of get the patterns of what we're looking at within these. Okay. So, why is lithium aluminum hydride stronger than sodium borohydride? When we go through and look at their structures, we've got our Lewis structures in both cases, right? If we looked at the molecular orbitals, okay, or sort of the molecular orbitals, okay, we would have that empty p orbital, which is where the electrons from our hydride could dump into. Is that true for both cases? Yes. So why is lithium aluminum hydride a stronger 
hydride source than sodium borohydride. What's the difference between those two molecules? I'll accept size a little bit if you can give me more specifics. What are you saying specifically? You're making the suggestion that aluminum versus boron is our difference. And you're saying that the aluminum p orbital does what to the hydride? Makes it more stable or less stable? Less stable. Less stable. So something about the aluminum p orbital can't stabilize that hydride as well as the boron hydride, right? Why? What is the difference between the boron p orbital and the aluminum p orbital? Is the aluminum a higher energy p orbital? It's a 3p orbital versus a 2p. What does that mean? The third energy level. What is the third energy level? Further from the nucleus. The further from the nucleus it becomes, those electrons now aren't stabilized by the nuclear charge as much, which means the H minus is more negative. We could go all the way back to atomic theory and looking at orbitals to explain the reactivity difference. This is why OCHEM is really cool. Okay? That's pretty fascinating. Okay? What else could we use to describe the difference? Because there's another one that I would argue is easier that we've talked about a lot this semester that doesn't have to do with orbitals. You're, you saw me start at the point, so you're like, maybe it'll give me a hint. No. Lithium and sodium? Sodium is bigger, so it's... Just... Lithium and sodium is an awesome option, because that is a difference, and I do agree that's a phenomenal idea. There's an easier thing than lithium and, so and sodium. The difference What's the difference between aluminum and boron? Yes. Size we just addressed. That's our P orbitals. Kind of charge. Electronegativity. electronegativity. They have a difference in electronegativity. Boron is higher on the periodic table than aluminum, which means boron's more electronegative. If it's more electronegative, what is it doing to the electrons that hydrogen's bringing in? It's holding them tighter, making the hydride less negative. Okay? We can use all of the same things that we've been doing throughout the semester to explain the difference between these. Okay? Can we also use sodium and lithium? Because hell, those things changed. Why did they change? Okay? Those ones become a lot trickier to deal with. Okay? And the reason why is what are the lithium and sodium doing? And as a subtle hint, I had to draw a second carbonyl. What charge are the lithium and the sodium? Positive. positive. What do those positive things need to interact with? Negatives. Negatives. Where is their negative? Oxygen. Our oxygen from our ketone. What happens is our lithium will coordinate to our oxygen. Our sodium will do the same thing. What is the difference between those coordinations? And conveniently, I actually drew them accurately. Why is lithium closer than sodium? Lithium is smaller. The closer that positive charge gets to that oxygen, what happens to the oxygen? it starts to feel more what? Positives. What happens is it starts to feel more positives. Okay, does oxygen want to become less negative? What does it do? It starts pulling the electrons from the pi bond away from the carbon, making our carbon 
more positive. The more positive that carbon becomes, the more susceptible it is to the hydride attack. Okay? So when we're looking at the difference in reactivity between these things, it is a massive scalar effect. So absolutely, <laughs> lithium aluminum hydride is the stronger reducing agent. The question again comes back to why and how do we know? Okay? We started with the how do you know based off of the reagent sequences. How did we stack those things? We saw that they were different. Now we go through and look at an atomic level to explain why they are different. Luth oh. <laughs> Lithium aluminum hydride is a significantly stronger reducing agent. I don't like using the word reducing agent or words reducing agent because that brings back memories of memorizing things. It generates a stronger H- minus than sodium borohydride. Okay? That's it. That's what you absolutely have to remember when you think about using these reagents when we're looking at carbonyls. Okay? The reason behind it was all of those other fun things. If we look now back to that solvent choice, why is the solvent choice important? If lithium aluminum hydride generates a strong H-, what could that H- react with? A carbon or acidic hydrogens floating around in solution. Those hydrogens do not have to be very acidic because that's such a strong negative hydrogen associated with lithium aluminum hydride. Okay? That means if I take lithium aluminum hydride and I put it in an alcoholic solvent or a water solvent, something with protons, that acid-base reaction happens very, very, very fast to produce hydrogen gas. Okay? It also is slightly exothermic. So we're generating enough heat that we could potentially combust our hydrogen gas. So we want to be a little bit more careful with our lithium aluminum hydride. Because if we run that at the wrong scale, we could actually ignite the hydrogen gas coming off of our reaction. And that's not a fun surprise. By, by scale, you mean what? Okay. How big do you run it? Oh, okay. Have you ever had something blow up in your face? Sorry, your hot topic question. Yes. Okay. Should have gone in the shower, too. <laughs> so when we look at something like NaH, that's free-floating hydride, right? When we look at NaH, is it free-floating hydride? No. With the NaH? No. Only on the surface of it do we have hydride. It's not free-floating. It's stuck in the solid phase. Because it stays close to... It has to stay close to the sodium. That bond is now very, very strong because hydride is so reactive. So it bonded to the thing? It is a very strong ionic bond. Okay. So the only way it breaks is when we give it an opportunity to react with something else, like something remotely acidic. So, like, the lithium, like, the, the ALH4, that would never... It breaks the bond as shown mechanistically. Almost always what you'll see people show for lithium aluminum hydride, if we were to look at a mechanism for this, we drew in that carbonyl, because I don't know if I've actually got the mechanism later on, would be something along these lines. You would just go immediately from that structure in. If you're getting really, really, really lazy... You might even show it as H minus. That is horrible to do because that's not true. We're not solvating H minus. That doesn't exist. Yeah. Okay. Have I been guilty of doing that? Absolutely. Because if you didn't take it out, then everything you said before it becomes problematic. Yeah. Okay. The next one, your boron reagent can do the same thing. It is still H minus. It is. But boron stabilizes that H- for long enough that we don't get a very fast acid-base reaction. Okay. The acid-base reaction slows down significantly, and I don't have to worry about that happening at a scale that's important. So when we go back, uh, well, I'm going to do it anyway, because I don't know what the next slide is shows it. So when we look at our reagent sodium borohydride, you almost always will see in a water or alcoholic environment. Alcoholic meaning 
No, sorry, that was bad. I'm glad I just stuck on that. Okay. Our alcohol functional group with any kind of carbon structure. Very often you see it as ethanol. Why? It's cheap. It's cheap. <laughs> That's the only reason. Okay. You almost always see it as ethanol because it's incredibly cheap. When we move to lithium aluminum hydride, we will never see an alcoholic solvent because we need the aprotic environment because lithium aluminum hydride is such a strong H minus that that acid base reaction would be too fast and we wouldn't get the nucleophilic addition. Okay? You're not laughing now, so that makes me nervous. Per our previous conversation. Uh, it depends. Why would we use ethanol versus uh, water? What's the difference between ethanol and water? One's protic, one's water protic. They're both protic. They're both polar. Yeah, that's the point. What else does the ethanol have? Dispersion. London dispersion. Why would I want London dispersion solvents in an organic chemistry class? Um, okay. Do you want to elucidate for everybody else that's still like hanging on the edge? Why would I want London dispersion forces in my solvent? Most of our molecules are organic, which means they're London dispersion. They won't dissolve in water. So water's a bad solvent. It may be protic and work for us because it gives us that positive hydrogen, but it won't dissolve our compound. Okay? So we need something that helps to dissolve the organic portion. Okay? London dispersion, London dispersion forces. You're going into solubility rules all the way back to the beginning of first semester lab. Okay? Okay. Nucleophilic additions. What does that mean for us? Okay. So number one, let's just take a quick scan through here. Would we expect all of these to do nucleophilic additions? And why? These all have carbonyls? No, they don't. You're going to have positive charge still because the nitrogen is more electronegative. Okay. All of these generate a polar pi bond. We have a partial positive carbon connected via a pi bond and a sigma bond to an electronegative element. All of these generate that partial positive, which means they can all react with a nucleophile. One of these may stand out and look extra weird. What one is that? Maybe the last one, because that's a linear structure. We might say, well, we can't do a backside attack, right? Are we doing backside attacks? No. Where are we reacting? Nope. You're reacting the pi system. You're reacting above and below the plane of the molecule. There's no backside attack. We're acting the p orbital of those, so we don't have to worry about that. So all of these will do nucleophilic addition. Okay? This is where students usually get tripped up, because you're used to recognizing just carbonyls, so you'd say aldehydes and ketones. But when we throw in a nitrogen, oh my god, we never talked about the imines, so those can't possibly react the same way. They do. They're the exact same functional group. It's a polar pi bond. Okay. All of these have the potential to react with sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride. Sodium borohydride will react with all of those. It doesn't react with the cyanide. Okay. Why not? What is different about the cyanide carbon than the rest? Okay. Yes, there's a triple bond. Something a little bit less obvious, though. It's not negative because it's connected to a CH or some carbon structure here. <laughs> what is the hybridization difference? Carbon is SP versus SP2. What's the difference between SP and SP2? SP is more electronegative, meaning what is it doing to the electrons? Holding them tighter, which means its charge becomes less positive than these ones. 
It's still positive because it's connected to the nitrogen, but it is less positive because the hybridization effect makes it less reactive. Okay, it makes it more electronegative. That doesn't make it negative. It's less. just less. more electronegative than the other ones, which makes it less positive. Lithium aluminum hydride will do all of them. Lithium aluminum hydride is that much more reactive. It will react with pretty much anything that you throw at it. Okay? Which gets up an interesting question as a preview into chapter 20, which is also kind of important because this came from your exam as well. Okay? Or similar to our exam. Okay? Take a look at those functional groups. Which of those would you predict to be most reactive with one of our hydrides, lithium aluminum hydride or sodium borohydride? And since we're not saying does it react, just most reactive. You guys think you got an idea now? Because Mo's the only one talking and whispering about ideas, we'll just call out Mo. What do you got? Um, I think it's the right one, but it could be the middle. You're going to say the right one is, <laughs> is the most reactive. Okay, so we'll say that one's the most reactive. Why, to make it easier, are you saying that one is more reactive than the ketone? Right, so your argument is that this being an electronegative atom is withdrawing electrons more so than the carbon in our ketone, which makes the carbonyl carbon more positive. Everybody agree? Good. That is correct. Which one's the next most reactive? Ester or ketone? Why is the ester now hard? Because it doesn't resonate. The argument you used for the acyl chloride was an inductive effect. Why did you not use a resonance effect? Can the chloride donate electrons in? No. No. Chloride really only has one bonding site. It doesn't make sense to form that second bond. Can the oxygen do resonance? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. What does that resonance do to the electrophilic carbon? It makes it less or more. more you can get away with more or less. It just depends what the second it word is. It makes it less positive. It makes it less positive. More negative technically works, but that's a little bit weird. Okay. It makes it less positive. Why? We're donating electrons into that positive carbon. Okay? If electrons are coming into it, it's now, by definition, less positive. Okay? We could make the argument that it's more negative, but that's like saying 2 is more negative than 3. It, it is, but they're still both positive numbers, and it gets a little weird. Does that kind of make sense? The ester has this resonance effect. Resonance trumps induction. That resonance effect stabilizes the carbonyl, making which one the more active electrophile, the ketone or the ester? The ketone. Okay. This chemistry is going to become super important in chapter 20. We don't worry about it as much uh, right now for chapters 17, 18, and 19. The primary reason being is that what could we classify both the oxygen and the chloride potentially as? Leaving groups. What does the ketone not have? A leaving group, which means all I can do is add to the ketone. I can only add to the aldehyde. There's no leaving group. If I add to an ester, what do I also have to potentially worry about? Something leaving. What reaction involves something leaving? 
eliminations and substitutions. Okay? When we move into chapter 20, the mechanism is typically or is known as a nucleophilic addition elimination. It appears that it's a substitution reaction. Okay? So, hydrogen nucleophiles, you guys want to do some practice? Too bad, you're doing it anyway. Okay, so let's try it this way. Have you guys at least done questions one and two? Yeah. Yeah. How many products did you get for question two? You're like, wait, you didn't, that's not how you phrase it. That doesn't matter. How many products did you get for question two? Okay, I heard a one. So I'm going to guess based on that statement, somebody else got a one. Did your one product look something along these lines? So step one, good job. That's fantastic. Really good job. Now that you've drawn a product, what should you evaluate? Step two. Do you have a stereo center? Yes, we do have a stereo center, which means that hydride could have reacted on the face towards or the face away from us, meaning I get two answers. I'd also have to get the enantiomer. Good news, we typically don't reference enantiomeric products when we're looking at nucle uh, the nucleophilic additions. Almost always we just draw them as the single bond and we ignore stereochemistry okay. as a kind of blanket statement. Why? I have no idea, but it wasn't until somebody asked, don't you have two products, that I went, oh, mm. you do. I have no idea why that wasn't shown anywhere in any of the textbooks. Right? It does get mentioned usually very briefly. There's a, a different name for the top versus bottom attack. I don't remember what they are. I think Cardi might talk about it. You just have to be aware of that. Not a huge issue. So, question one. What would you guys get for an answer? Hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas. Good, safe bet. I like it. And? The reactant. Yes. Okay. This is a format for a potential ACS question. They could ask, what's the product? They will show the alcohol. They might even show both alcohols, okay? One wedged, one dashed. So you get both from there. Even say, answer choice C, A and B, being the enantiomeric pair. And answer choice D will be the starting material. Or it'll be H2 gas. And you'll be like, why would they draw the starting material out? Because they're saying there's no reaction. Okay? So be careful with your multiple choice. No reaction can get written as no reaction. It can also get written as just showing the starting material again. Okay? Three. Benzene rings don't react. What happens to our carbonyl? Becomes OH. Beginning to end, what have I added across the pi bond? I added what? Hydride, hydride and hydrogen. hydrogen. Where'd the hydrogen come from? I see the hydride. Methanol, that H plus, may not be as obvious when they write out the name of the solvent. Okay. You do have to remember your alls or alcohols. There is an acidic hydrogen there. Question four gets a little bit tricky as well. Why is four tricky? This is the product. You have to work your way backwards. What does sodium borohydride react with? Pi bonds. In particular, what type of pi bond? A polar pi bond. So if I was to draw out my starting material, I need a polar pi bond. Okay. How is that bond polar? Something electronegative needs to be attached to it. What's the electronegative element? How do I know it's oxygen? I look to my product. My product has that oxygen. Okay, and there's my, not, my polar pi bond. I'm adding the hydride 
to that carbon. What happened to the rest of the structure? Nothing, which means draw it all in. <coughs> Make sense? All right. Good job. That's our hydride nucleophiles. We will come back and look at lithium aluminum hydride and sodium borohydride in chapter 20 when we've got leaving groups. Okay? That's where we see the big difference between the reactivity of sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride. I did throw out one case on how we could see a difference in this unit. So let's go ahead and make a real quick adjustment to one of these questions. help if I didn't just draw the starting material again. So that middle reaction, what happened? I turned the carbonyl carbon into an alcohol. So we could label this as what type of reaction? Except two answers, only because Cass was suggesting one earlier. It's a reduction reaction. We wouldn't call it oxidation. I know redox always gets paired, but in OCHEM, we only care about the organic molecule. What happened to the organic molecule in this case? It was reduced. So all I'm concerned about is calling this a reduction. Okay, so I could reference this as a reduction. What else could I reference it as? Unfortunately, no, I can't label it as an acid base. Why not? What did I add? I have to label it as a nucleophilic addition. I can't call it an acid base. To call it an acid base, what must only happen? A transfer of a hydrogen, and in particular, we're looking at hydrogen as an acidic hydrogen, not hydride. And unfortunately, we added hydride in the course of this reaction. So I can't call it an acid base. So we could reference this as a reduction. We could also call it just a standard addition. So this fits within our five categories. It's still an addition reaction. If I want to look at the mechanism, I could call this a nucleophilic, nucleophilic addition. Okay. What reagent allows me to do this? Sodium borohydride or, which is kind of leading, what two reagents do reductions right now? LAH or sodium borohydride. Lithium aluminum hydride usually gets written as LAH. So two answers. You got a 50-50 shot. Technically, it's actually 30%. Lithium aluminum hydride, sodium borohydride, or both? Only sodium borohydride works in this case. Why? I have that acidic hydrogen out there. If I react this with lithium aluminum hydride, what happens? I get the acid base reaction. Step two would be add H3O plus, puts the hydrogen right back on, and I'd be right back to my starting material. Lithium aluminum hydride does not work to complete this step. Does that make sense? Is there a question there, Mo? <laughs> LAH does the acid base reaction, removing the hydrogen here. Is this reaction an acid base reaction? No, but no. doesn't it add H minus? This reaction adds H minus, which is not an acid base reaction. What happens in this case? Okay, so let's go through and look. Because I think this is what you're getting at, and it's looking at the nuances of these definitions, so it's important. I think I placed that in the right spot. OH, LAH. Whoops. What type of reaction was run in purple? That is an acid base reaction. LAH is running an acid base reaction. The one underneath? 
not acid base. Why is the top one now okay to say acid base? I'm only looking at the transfer of H plus to H minus. The bottom case, H minus, is reacting with a carbon. Okay? So it's not just, well, it's H minus, so now it's not an acid base. Look at the structure. Even if you did the top one in two steps, you still couldn't do it with LH, right? Ask me after class, because right now I'm going to say as a blanket statement, no for the sake of anybody's understanding. If you're really, really curious about that, you can press me on it after class. Okay. Other questions? Cool. That's our hydride nucleophile. Okay. So now we can move to carbon nucleophiles. How do we get carbon nucleophiles? As a hint, you've got three options here. You know all three of these. Grignard is actually going to go in as a fourth option. The only reason you know that is because we did it in the lab or you read ahead. Carbene. Uh, I'm not counting carbenes because carbenes are also an electrophile. So no carbenes. Not quite because we can't get a carbon with a metal attached. How do we do that? How do you make that species? If you can't answer that question, then you can't provide that as an answer. Okay, CH3Br. What charge is the carbon? Positive. Is that a nucleophile? Damn it. What charge does the carbon need to be to be a nucleophile? Negative. Negative. So, as a good first start, I need a negative carbon in all three of these answers. Cyanide. Cyanide gets me a negative carbon. Yes, we've seen that. That nitrogen, that is the nitrogen thing. How do you make that? How did, how did you get the lithium connected to that structure? <laughs> because what I'm going to argue is that that fits under the Grignard as an organolithium, yeah. which we haven't talked about how you get yet. So if you don't know how to get it, you can't say you, we've talked about it. I was like, maybe nobody saw. <laughs> Any welders? Do we have welders? Anybody welded? What gas do you use? No? Okay. That was a, an attempt. <laughs> what happens when you have uh, CX4, right? So you have carbon attached to... I think where you're trying to go is with a carbene, and I said no carbenes because they also act as electrophiles. That's a, it was a really good guess. I'm not going to lie. I, was, I, I had to back away on that one. That was kind of a hard one. Morgan suggested that earlier too. We spent all day last Wednesday miserably failing at explaining them. Then Monday we did a really good job talking about these. And I didn't record it. <laughs> we would need a stupidly strong base to potentially make the kinetic version of these. Not quite. LDA can be used to make one of these if given a, to getting at the right idea. An enolate. If I take LDA, whoops, LDA, 
with a ketone, I can remove that acidic hydrogen to make a negative carbon. That negative carbon can now attack. So enolate chemistry gets me a negative carbon. The last one, because the enolate was the, probably the only one that you would have remembered. I was surprised you got cyanide, to be honest. I always forget. Well, not you. <laughs> I forget that one. Okay. Acetylide. Okay, so enolates, acetylides, and cyanides are all three carbon nucleophiles that you've seen before. Okay. So we have access to those. The thing behind those is that we have to run some kind of interesting things to stabilize those. And number three with the cyanide and number two, ultimately those can happen because we've changed the electronegativity of the carbon so much by making it SP hybridized and we're reacting it with really strong bases to help set those up that those were kind of boring. The enolate's kind of neat. Right? Because we're putting it, uh, the carbon near another functional group to really call attention to it. But in all of those, we're actually putting a new functional group or an old functional group near our carbon. Okay. When we move to, say, the Grignards okay, or the Gilmans, we can make a CH3 on its own negative, sp3 carbon. That was kind of cool. Good timing, sort of. Okay. That's why the Grignards are so powerful and they get this extra name. Okay. Why they're named after the person that discovered them. Okay. We'll also see negative carbons in the case... Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll just say that. Not easy chem chemistry because our carbon is small and unelectronegative. Okay. So when we're looking through at these mechanisms, they become a little bit harder to discover, which is why the person that discovered them gets to attach their name to them. Okay. There's three common names that show up when it comes to carbon negatives. And since we've got now a blank three going on, the first one was listed because we did it in the lab. Grignard. Wittig. And Gilman. So you will hear reference to those three names going back to carbon nucleophiles. The Grignard and the Wittig are both, I don't think there's an N there. Uh, the Grignard and the Wittig are both stupidly strong nucleophiles. The Gilman, just a strong one. So remember when we had that conversation about where's that line? That's the line. Gilman is just strong. The Wittig and the Grignard are both stupidly strong. All right? And it has to do with some of the characteristics of those reagents. So when we go through and look at the Grignard and the organolithiums, in both cases, we're starting with an alkyl halide, some carbon-containing structure with a bromine. Okay, we don't care about the hybridization of the carbon. This can happen on SP, SP2. Uh, well, I don't think we would ever do it on SP carbons, just for the record. Um, and then a halogen. It's usually bromine. We react them with either magnesium or lithium. Not magnesium ion, not lithium ion, but the metals. As metals, they have extra electrons. Magnesium has exactly two extra electrons. Lithium has one. Both of these would go through a single electron transfer pathway, a fancy way of saying radical hell, to go through and insert the metal into that carbon-bromine bond. It's really a full insertion when we're looking at the magnesium, officially our Grignard, because magnesium carries what charge? Plus two. A plus two. Bromide's a minus one, which means our carbon is minus one. Minus one. Okay. So the magnesium inserts itself in between those two atoms, and we get a negative carbon. With the lithium, because there's only one electron, it can only form one, of one bond. It doesn't really insert. It really cleaves, but it's going through the same ultimate mechanism. Okay? And we end up forming, again, a negative carbon. Okay? What could we do with negative carbons? How do you do that with the lithium and the bromine if they both have negative one plus one energy? <coughs> you know, where's the negative carbon? Where's the
You just need two equivalents of lithium to do it. Notice there's a lithium BR outside the box. You just need two equivalents. You can talk to me after class for clarity on that. Okay. So because this is kind of neat and rare chemistry, it got named after Victor Grignard. Why might it be rare? It's a negative carbon. Why is it useful? Okay, it's a negative carbon. I can now build larger carbon structures. Okay. Everything we've looked at pretty much up to this point, I'm stuck with one carbon structure. I can't get bigger or smaller for that matter. Once I start with it, I'm there and I can just kind of change the pieces on it, but that's it. Now I can actually build to larger structures. Okay. Why is it tricky? It's a negative carbon. And what can a negative carbon do? It can act as a nucleophile. Well, isn't that what we wanted it to do? Why does that make it tricky? And it can act as a base. Okay. It's that base chemistry that makes this tricky because I want it to act exclusively as a nucleophile. Okay. The structure is so unstable that it ends up acting very, very large, which means as a nucleophile, it's a pretty sterically hindered nucleophile. If it's sterically hindered, that would suggest it should act as a base. So this is why when it acts as a nucleophile, it really only acts as a nucleophile in nucleophilic additions. We need the special approach of that pi system to allow it to react. It can't do backside attacks and substitution mechanisms. Okay? If we're going to run with a standard alkyl halide, we end up seeing our Grignard act as a base, and we do what type of reaction? Acid base. Mm, might be easier if we drew one out. Here's our alkyl halide. We just said the nucleophilic attack doesn't happen because the Grignard is too large. So what does it react with? It doesn't look too large. Remember, the negative carb carbon is so unstable, just like the hydride for sodium hydride. There's an acidic hydrogen on the outside. It pulls the hydrogen off, which we could label as acid base, but then we're saying we're allowed to form what? A negative carbon. Am I allowed to do that? No. So this is not an acid-base reaction we're initiating. What reaction are we initiating? Addition. Try again. Elimination. We're doing an elimination. Okay. So we have to be cognizant of that secondary chemistry with our Grignard reagents. It can get in the way and mess with our reactions. Okay, I won't erase it. It's slowing me down. <laughs> Just kidding. Hi. We've already looked at how hydrides attack carbonyls. Grignards are doing the same thing. Hi. So we just have to evaluate, well, what would happen if it was an aldehyde? What would happen if it's a ketone? And all we're just doing is seeing how that negative carbon goes through an attack. So we good? Okay. We could look at the mechanism. I don't want to look at the mechanism. Okay. That happened a bit suddenly. I apologize. So let's erase some of that, clean that up a little bit. Okay. If I started off with formaldehyde, and I've got my Grignard reagent now attacking, what happens? Well, I break the pi bond, I form that negatively charged carbon, and ignore that for the moment. Okay. Is that reaction favorable? Yes. yes, I went from a negative carbon to negative oxygen. negative oxygen. That is a favorable thing to do. What can that negative oxygen now react with? Okay. It would have to react with something positive. Is there anything positive in solution at this point? No. If water was present, where does the carbon attack? It would attack the hydrogen of water. So there's no water present. Okay, so our reaction stalls at this point and stops. 
until, until we go through and notice it's a step two, we add our acid. Sometimes shown as H3O+, plus, sometimes H+, plus, sometimes it's even shown as just water. Okay, pretty much all of them will work. The end result is we have what functional group? And <laughs> What's the functional group? It's an alcohol. What kind of alcohol? It looks like it's a primary. A primary alcohol because it's connected to one carbon. one carbon. What happens if instead of starting with formaldehyde, I decided to start with that functional group? What functional group is that? That is an aldehyde. If I start with an aldehyde and go through this reaction, what kind of alcohol will I get? Secondary. I will get a secondary. What happens if I switch this now to the other? The other. <laughs> the other carbonyl compound? A ketone, we'd end up with a tertiary alcohol. If you want that mechanism, I think it's in the slides. You can just look at it. It's identical for all of these. Okay? So, let's take a quick look at some of these. Uh, and by quick, well, let's see. How close is the bidding? How close is it? Mm, it's pretty close. So, first one, you should be able to do on your own. There's nothing tricky beyond that. Second one, this one's tricky. What do we get for our product? I know it's tricky. It doesn't matter. You can still think fast. I actually told you it's a trick question. So what should you immediately not have the Grignard do? Probably shouldn't attack the carbonyl. What's it going to attack instead? It's going to attack the acidic hydrogen. We have to look for that. What? You were right. That's the acidic hydrogen. <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't know what happened there, but we'll accept that. What comes out as the answer? There's two common ways that you would see it on a multiple choice. You would see it potentially drawn out, fully all out like that. The other option is that they have the Grignard go through and do the standard. Wait, nothing happened. Yeah. Look what I drew. Nothing changed because oh. 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 nothing changed because what does the Grignard do? It comes in, removes the hydrogen, and then what do you do in the very next step? You put the hydrogen right freaking back on. No, I'm not doing that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Okay. So we could see it as that as a product. Very commonly, they actually don't show that as a product. They show this. And most people go, oh, well, that's the BS answer that no one's supposed to guess. Oh, because it has a byproduct. When CH3 removes a hydrogen, what does it become? CH4. So the answer that nearly everybody goes, oh, that can't be right, was the right answer. Because we tend to ignore that the Grignard is an organic reagent. It does produce two organic products. Those organic products tend to be different. And we tend to ignore one of them. That's like, that, okay. that's like carbon dioxide. That's it's exactly like carbon dioxide, which is a fun one to go ahead and bring up because the next tricky one is in the upper right-hand corner. We've got our clear negative because we've got the magnesium. What's the carbonyl I'm reacting with? I don't see it. There's a carbonyl in CO2. Well, there's four valence, six times two. That would get me, you know, 16 electrons. So if I drew this out, carbon, oxygen, oxygen, one, two, three, four. Oh. Yeah, there's my Lewis structure with a carbonyl. This comes in and attacks, breaks that open. The end result, carbon O minus, step two. 
adds the hydrogen, and I've got a carboxylic acid. Okay? I thought I was going to go through that faster than I did, so oh well. Um, we will pick up Monday, and I'll look at those other three. The next couple slides, just look at some of the kind of tricky things that the textbook brings in. When we look at Grignard reagents, make sure you don't have any other secondary functional groups that could potentially react, like our alcohols okay, or other active carbonyls in your Grignard. So watch out for those.